step down as the organizer of the PHP meetup so that I could, you know, do a not so hostile takeover. Um, and it's, it's great to have these two kind of really big historic groups together and, um, and you know, having the same meetup. Cool. So today we have, we actually had uh, two talks originally and then Aiden, who I think is still on his way, I don't think he's here. Oh, there he is. Okay, cool. Hello. Um, so Aiden's going to do a talk as well. Uh, it's going to be the second talk. Ruben's going to do the first talk. He's, he's definitely here somewhere. Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, and so originally I was going to do this talk, which I did at the Brisbane meetup, which I think maybe one or two of you might have dialed into, but I kind of cut it down. I, I will still do some of it if there's time, but I don't want to like take away from these other two guys because usually the problem is it's really hard to get enough speakers for meetups. So if there's time, I'll do part of my presentation, but if there's not, that's fine. I can do it at the next meetup, not a big deal. Um, cool. So just a really quick announcement. So for those who might not know, there's the Laracon um, AU happening next next month in November. Uh, I think it's yeah Thursday, Friday, 16th, 17th of November. Um, if you don't have a ticket yet, they are still on sale. Uh, big shout out to Michael Durinda for organizing it. Um, I think he's still in Adelaide. Is that right? Yes. Um, you know, I, I feel sad for him, but but still, you know. Good on him for bringing together the, the PHP community here um, and Vue.js as well, I guess. It's um, like, if, if you think about it, obviously US and EU are two really big markets, um, but we, we here have like a, a tiny fraction of their population. So it's not so easy to organize any given conference, especially one like this. So I think it's a, it's a huge achievement. It's not an easy thing to do. So um, yeah, please, please support him, support the events. Um, you, you can still buy a ticket and um, also, we have one free ticket, which is being donated by somebody. They they asked to not be named, so I will I will keep them confidential. But uh, we're going to be giving away this ticket tonight. So if you're interested to go to this conference and you do not yet have a ticket, um, stay tuned. We're going to run a little kind of like a lucky prize draw during the break. So stay tuned for that. Um, but if you don't get lucky and if you don't have a ticket, highly encourage you to to buy one and attend anyway. Cool. All right. So, yeah. Thanks for Cover Genius for sponsoring. So, yeah, I work for Cover Genius, as, as you may or may not know, if you depending on whether you know me or not. Um, sponsoring the beer, sponsoring the pizza. It'll come probably like after the first talk is finished. Um, yeah, we are always on the lookout for great engineers. Um, so maybe I will have Sean here just uh, talk for a few minutes about that. Uh, thank you, Max. Um, yeah, cheers for the music as well. I heard some infected mushroom and a whole bunch of other <laughs> Russian playlists, which was great. Um, thank you also for clarifying who Anonymous was, because I was thinking he was the hacker group. I'm like, why would they be? <laughs> why would they be sponsoring this random thing? So thank you for clarifying. Uh, so yeah, I'm Sean. I sit in the recruitment team here at Cover Genius. Um, I've already met Ty, and he said, "What does Cover Genius do?" So quick raise of hands. Does anyone know what we do? No, so <laughs> one person. All right, awesome. So let me give you a quick high level. So we're a later stage um, tech startups. We're at Series D, round of investment. Um, originally started in Sydney, Australia, but we've shifted our corporate headquarters over to New York. Um, globally, we've got about 550 people and we're growing and growing and growing. So what do we do? So Cover Genius, we partner with a whole bunch of companies. So some of the more famous ones are like eBay, Amazon, um, Booking.com, Skyscanner.com, the list goes on. So what do we do? So let's say you're buying a laptop on Amazon.com. You're clicking around, you're looking for the right laptop, etc. When you're at the, the buy screen, you'll have an opportunity to add insurance um, to that product. Um, not shipping insurance, um, actually insuring the product. So if you drop it, if you sit on it, if you crack the screen, whatever, you will have insurance on that. Similar to Apple Care on the Apple side. So when you're buying an iPhone, getting Apple Care is ubiquitous because you know for a fact you're buying a two and a half thousand dollar iPhone, you're gonna drop it and smash it to smithereens. So you're gonna get it. Now, why I'm mentioning Apple is Apple Care equates to roughly 30% of their overall revenue, right? And think about how many products Apple has, a handful. 
So when you're looking at and extrapolating those numbers looking at Amazon, they've got a gazillion one different products. So we see that as a trillion dollar, well, that's with a capital T, a trillion dollar market opportunity. And that's what we're going after. So we're growing, growing, growing. Um, for me personally, I've been in tech startups for a million years. Obviously, massive tech recession this year. Cover Genius is one of the only companies that are massively exploding, and that's with what the market's going going through. So Max asked me to speak because we are hiring PHP people, also Python people, and a whole bunch of other people, um, expanding our team across Australia, the rest of APAC, and the rest of the world. Um, that's a five-second spiel about who we are. Um, whoever's next would like to talk, go for it. Or has anyone got any quick questions? Don't ask all at once. That's okay. Well, while he's getting set up with his Taylor Swift headset, it's uh, <laughs> <was> pretty fancy. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thanks everyone for coming um, to the office as well. We are getting pizza. I was hoping, I'm stressing out, I'm like, if I have to talk first and then pizza comes, no one's listening. <laughs> so it is coming at about seven, which is good. And then, yeah. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Max. And thanks for having me talk some crap. So thanks. Sweet. All right. So we'll we'll begin in, in a minute. Um, and yeah. So yeah, like like Sean said. So if you're interested in a job here, talk to him. Talk to me. Find somebody else with a CG T-shirt um, or somebody that looks like they work here. Uh, <laughs> we we really we're we're doing a lot of very interesting things, like solving a lot of interesting um, engineering challenges. So um, I know a lot of my friends always make fun of me working in insurance, but it's it's a very ignoring that. The tech side of it is very fun. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So lastly, um, so obviously, like it's, it's coming towards the end of the year. Really fantastic to put together this event. Um, kind of apologize. I haven't been able to organize something earlier this year, but I've been overseas a lot. And then I was very busy or lazy, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but but I'm looking. Yeah, I really want to uh, organize the next one probably in March. Then just the reason is there's going to be obviously a lot of holidays. There's going to be a lot of people away, and also I'm away in February. Um, however, in March I think we'll do the next event. If you're interested in speaking at all, um, please please come and chat to me. If you're interested in doing any talk about anything, um, you don't have to be the world's foremost expert on on anything. Like this guy here probably is, but you know. <laughs> The, yeah, the, the most interesting uh, meetup talks is, is literally just like somebody, you know, giving their um, giving their thoughts or, or retelling their story about how, like, maybe how they solved some particular challenge or some particular problem, how their product has evolved over time, like, I don't know, how they've, even like how they've undergone organizational changes or tech changes. So your, your experience in your company working on your product, so that's probably the most interesting thing you can talk about. It doesn't have to be like, you know, world leading something, this or that. Um, so yeah, please come chat to me during the break if you're interested. Uh, there's plenty of time to prepare as well, like there's heaps of time until March. But without any further delay, I'd like to introduce um, my friend and colleague, Ruben Funai, fun guy. Um, yeah. Do you want to just do a test? Okay. Does that work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. That works. No. I think that's the... No, that's fine. Those. All right. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, just give me a sec to share my screen. Can I share my screen, Max, or does it permit permission? Thanks. <clears throat> All righty. This. Hopefully, this is the right window. Is that, do we have to pin something? Oh, there it is, sorry, a bit slow. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, my name's Ruben. Uh, I've been a PHP developer for about 15 years. Um, been a Laravel developer for about maybe, I don't know, seven, something like that. Um, and yeah, Laravel is my favorite framework. So I want to show you guys why. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Laravel is considered uh, the leading um, and most feature-rich uh, framework in the PHP community. Um, amongst its out-of-the-box uh, arsenal are loads of tools. Um, in particular, the ones we're going to talk about today is how to implement REST APIs with those tools straight out of the box. 
Um, so we'll get started by writing uh, an API with Laravel and explore all the features that Laravel provides to us to be able to make this task really easy. Now, keep in mind, this is a huge topic. And given that we're doing the lightning talks format uh, of the meetups at the moment, I am just going to break all these talks up into little pieces. And this is the getting started one, as you guys can see. So you may know these at the beginning, but as we do more meetups, you'll get into more, we'll get into more advanced features. Cool. So we all know how to start a Laravel project. I just went ahead just then and ran this command and created a brand new Laravel project. So if you're not aware that documentation is online, you can look it up without a problem. Cool. Um, so I'll start with some basics. Um, REST APIs, for those who don't know, um, involves the creation, manipulation, and deletion of resources um, utilizing HTTP verbs, um, get, post, patch, delete, generally. Um, generally, these resources are your models in your backend, uh, but they don't have to be. You can make virtual resources if it makes sense for your application logic. Um, so a web-based API uh, generally has three basic components. Um, it's got routes, it's got controllers, and it's got models. Your routes are the ones that your consumers will use to be able to do different things on your API. Your controllers will receive those requests and perform the tasks that need to be done for each of those requests, and your models are how you persist your resources. Um, Laravel has out of the box commands to create each of these components for you really quickly. You can make a controller, make a resource class, a request class, or a model. We'll talk a bit more about uh, resource classes and request classes a bit in another slide, um, but the other two I'm sure you're probably um, familiar with. Um, it basically creates scaffold uh, objects and to, uh, sorry, scaffold classes so that it has the structure ready for use and everything basically synergizes really nice with each other. Um, in particular, the make model command has a dash dash all option, which allows you to get controllers, request classes, resources, policies, everything out of the box ready for that model and follows a nice naming convention as well. Um, cool. So, um, We'll talk about resource controllers. So in Laravel, generally, when you want to write a um, REST API, you want to use resource controllers. Resource controllers are basically a class which has the word controller in it. If you want to, you don't have to. Um, but Laravel will create five methods on it. It will create uh, index, store, uh, show, update, and delete. Each one of them represents one of the HTTP verbs, the get, the post, uh, another get for one user, the patch, and a delete. Um, this is generally the naming convention used for REST um, endpoints. So a get with users without a single, without any ID on it will return all the users. A post to the users will create a new user. Get with the ID will get one user. And patch and delete will delete that specified user. So what we'll do is we'll jump straight into some code so we can see how this works. Um, we'll just get my meet to start presenting on there. Yep, cool. And I'll share my PHP storm, which hopefully you guys can see. Which PHP storm am I using? Ah, Laravel 10, the latest version of Laravel. Yeah, so cool. All righty, all righty. Can you guys see it? Um, no worries, it's using the light theme. So maybe I'll just quickly change to the dark one. Is that all right? <laughs> Everyone can see better? Yeah. Is it a bit zoomed out or is it okay? No? It's all right? Okay, cool, no worries. All right. Sorry? It's a good question. How do you do that on PHP Storm? <laughs> Any Shift alt dot. Yeah, that's not working. So, never mind. If, if, if... Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. In the editor, it's fine. I meant the UI. No, that's okay. No problem. All right. All good. Uh, all right. No worries. Um, so, we'll actually start um, just by quickly enabling a uh, the PHP units um, SQLite database. Um, we'll do it to be able to write some tests. So, by default, Laravel comes with that default. But uh, uh, turned off by default, but you can turn it on so that your tests run a bit faster while you're uh, showing, uh, well, while you're testing something very quickly. 
Um, so we'll run the first command, PHP Artisan make controller. Now, the nice thing about these commands is they actually interactively help you out. So when you run one, notice how I didn't give it any arguments, and it will actually ask me for what the controller's name should be. This was implemented recently by Jess Archer, one of the Laravel developers, and she has made a fantastic job out of this. So it's made uh, life really easy. So we'll actually make a controller for uh, the user model, and we will create some resources. It, notice how it asks us what type of things we want along with the controller. So we'll make a resource, which I'll explain in, 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 a, in a minute. Um, but the particular one we want is the API resource. So when you make a normal resource, Laravel will actually give you more than five methods. It will give you seven. Uh, two of them are create and edit. These ones are used so that when you hit the application, it will actually render you HTML to give you the opportunity to render a form for the user so they can fill it out and actually create it. We're not going to be doing that because we're writing a REST API that has no front end. It's headless. So we won't be using a resource. Instead, we will be using an API. Singleton, if you guys would like to know, is a controller that allows you to create a resource that does not require you to provide an ID. A classic example of that is, for example, a user profile. So when you have a user, generally they will only have one profile. So it doesn't make sense for your endpoint to include the ID of this profile because you already know the first one you find for the user is the one you want to show. So that's the idea of a singleton controller. And invocable controller, for those who are familiar with the command pattern, allows you to break down a controller so that instead of having five methods or seven methods, you have an entire controller just for that method. Allows and helps a lot for encapsulation. I'd only recommend that generally for larger applications who start to scale quite a bit and you want to encapsulate more. For simple pet projects, just use the resource and controllers. They'll be, they'll be fine for you. Um, cool. So once I've set, set API, what model would you like to use this for? You can type user and it'll actually look in my code base and see that I have a user model. So it appears as a drop down and I can select it. Um, cool. So it should have made some files for us. Um, well, basically the user controller. So if we actually open up the user controller, we can actually see what methods have been created for it. So we can see it's actually made the index store, the show, update, and the destroy. Now, the fantastic thing about this, that Laravel, when it creates these methods, for example, the show a user or the update a user, it actually puts in the user inside the argument of that function. The reason is because Laravel supports binding resolution. So if on your route you have a user ID, and it sees that you have type hinted the model user in that argument, it will go to the user model and it will try to find the user that matches that ID and provide it to you as an object. If it doesn't find it, it will throw a 404 error to you back without you having to implement anything. This is a fantastic feature from Laravel and it, uh, it speeds up development so much. Um, to start, we'll actually use, um, we'll implement the index model. Sorry, the index method, right? So what we'll do is we'll say, for example, we'll start a very basic uh, index method, and we will just do a user get and return that. So what that will do is it will list all the users we have, and it will return them to the consumer. Um, to test this out, we'll actually create a test using PHP unit. And oops, I put it in the wrong place, but hopefully it won't mind. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, PHP unit by default will use the PHP, sorry. PHP Storm by default, we use the PHP unit test case. We actually don't want to use that one. We want to use Laravel's one. So we will just import it uh, test test case. And so we'll make it a little simple function. Um, so we'll do public, uh, sorry, pub f um, test it lists users. Yo. Oh, sorry. This is my bad, my bad, my bad. Sorry, guys. How's that? That bigger? Yep, sorry about that, guys. Let me know if there's ever a size that's uh, too small, and I'll increase it. Cool. Um, cool. So what we'll do is we'll do this, um, get JSON. And here's the fantastic part about um, the controller. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. When you create a new controller in the routes API, you need to assign it to, um, to the route. So this is the way things get really nice. So if you use the route aside from Laravel, you can actually tell it to use an API resource. And what it will do is it'll ask you for the name of that resource. In this case, we're going to call it users. And we'll actually link it to the user controller, Maybe like that. So what it will do is it will actually create all the routes I need to be able to manipulate the user. So if I use this artisan command, I'm not sure if, it's, if you can see that. And I run PHP artisan route list. Then, oops, I spelled artisan wrong. Artisan, there we go, artisan, cool. You can actually, go away. <laughs> 
you can actually see that it's actually created these routes, which are the ones that I showed you in the second slide. They're the uh, REST API routes. And the best thing about it, it's also given them names. It follows a nice naming convention. So it means that when I do my test, like here, I don't actually have to remember what the URL of this is. And the benefit of that is that, as you can see, there's actually a prefix in front of that API endpoint. In certain applications, at some point, you might end up having to modify that prefix, or you might have want a different prefix, like a V1 or something like that. So it would be it's quite annoying if you have to update all the tests that have referenced the previous endpoint just to get your tests working. So Laravel gives you a nice helper called route, right, which allows you to use the name of that route. And then it will resolve that route for you automatically. So in this case, we want the users.index to be able to list all the users. We'll assert that it's successful. And just so that we can see this response, we will dump it right here. By default, it will not do anything. Let me just write test, dash, dash, filter. And we'll run this test. Uh, by default, it won't. Oh, yeah, yeah I knew it wouldn't find it because I put it in the wrong place. <laughs> Let me just move this into this feature function here. There. And I will fix the namespace feature. Oh, no, wrong one. This one here, feature. There we go. Did I refactor that correctly? I did, but it cut off HTTP. OK, so I'll just delete that just to make it work for now. And we will try to run this again. OK, cool. No worries. Uh, and I forgot to tell it to refresh the database. So use refresh database. So it's failing because it can't find the users table. So you have to give the, tra the trait refresh database. So it actually runs the migrations. So as you can see, it's actually empty. And the reason is because I haven't actually created a user. So if I go to user and I create a user using my, I did type create, didn't I? <laughs> uh, in my factory, I'll see that there's my user. And that's all it takes to actually create your very first endpoint. As you can see, it took me two seconds. I just created a controller, returned the user get all, and there you go. It returns everything. <laughs> um, cool. So um, let's see here. We, at the moment, the way that the controller is returning is it's actually querying everything in Eloquent and is returning every single field it finds in the database. In part, except for the ones that are marked as hidden. So if we actually look at the user model, I'll just actually hide this, right? You can see that Eloquent by default has a hidden property that hides the password field and the remember token field. They're like sensitive fields, right? So you don't really want to send them to your consumer. And as you saw, you don't, we don't have them here. So that works great. Um, but there might be other scenarios where that's not the best way to do this. Yes. Yeah, zoom into the, sorry. Yeah, very good. Here we go. There we go. You guys see the hidden? Yeah? <laughs> Sorry again. Um, so that works great. But there might be scenarios where this is insufficient. This will always hide it when you're serializing and you're sending it to every, every, every consumer. But you might have, for example, a um, consumer that is part of your internal company. But let's say, for example, there is a, um, a consumer that wants to be able to see the remember token for some particular internal reason, right? So this hidden will actually prevent that from happening all the time. So rather than using and relying on the hidden for everything, what we use in Laravel is actually uh, resources. So I'll actually make one, PHP artisan. Artisan, make resource, and I will make a user resource. Now user resources um, are the serialized representation of what you want to send to your consumer. So by default, it will actually call the to array method on the resource you want. So in Eloquent, Eloquent has a to array method, which serializes every single property except for the hidden ones. Rather than relying on that, we should actually create resources to control what we're returning to the, re to the user. For example, we want, them, we want to send the user the ID. Sorry, we want to send the consumer the ID of the user. And maybe we want to send uh, them the name. We'll sign this name. And maybe we want to send them the email in this email. And there we go. So if we actually run the test, uh, sorry, and we have to modify the controller. So in order to use this resource, we can actually uh, remove that, call user resource, and resources have a method on them called collection. 
The reason why it's using a method called collection is because you have multiple resources, right? And notice how I implemented only one resource. So collection allows Laravel to say, okay, you're about to give me an array of some sort, right? I will create a resource for each one of those so that I can serialize. So if I give it the get to the collection, and I'll just put it in a new line just so you guys can. Oh, and I will zoom in because I'm guessing it's small. There we go. Okay, cool. So hopefully you guys can see that now. The resource collection should serialize that with only the fields that I specified in the resource. That's the ID, the name, and the email. So when I run my test again, remember I had a whole bunch of stuff in here, including email verified at, created at, and updated at. When I run this test again, I now only have ID, email, and name. So the great thing about this is if you add new columns into your database without thinking about whether or not your consumer needs it or not, or whether or not it's sensitive information, resource protects you with that, right? It doesn't accidentally send new fields that you've added in the database. It makes you explicitly define them so that you are in control of what you're returning to your consumer and allows you to specify multiple resources for the same resource. Sorry about the confusion, but I'll just explain that. You could have a user resource like we just made, and you can have a user internal resource, for example, or an internal user resource. The internal user resource may include fields that are sensitive in nature and should only be used by your internal APIs. So this is the power of resource. You can actually of the resources, you can actually represent the same resource and serialize it in two different ways for different consumers. Those benefits. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, Let's implement the store uh, method. So I'll hide this. Uh, where's the controller? Here we go, here's the controller. So store method, you want to create, oh, sorry, one last thing before I, I jump onto that. Um, as you know, Eloquent uh, allows pagination, or maybe you're, you're, you're maybe not, uh, paginate is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> sorry, thank you, paginate, there we go. Okay, um, Eloquent supports pagination and resources automatically uh, synergize with that. So if I actually run this test again, uh, the resource is here inside this data property as before, but now it's actually got links and metadata for the pagination. So you don't have to worry about implementing that manually. It's already built into Laravel. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Um, yeah, so as you can see, the, the, the resource, even though I use the resource, it still includes all the information required for the pagination. You don't have to manually implement that. All right, so let's move on to the store. So let's say you want to create a new user, right? So traditionally, when you make a, an API, you have the request. As you can see, Laravel has provided this for us, and we want to actually create a user. So we can use uh, Eloquence um, create method right to actually create a user now if i remember correctly um the users table has three requirements i'll just zoom in again here hopefully you can see that cool and um, so name is required it's not nullable email is required it's not nullable and password is required it's not nullable the other ones are nullable so to create a user we need at least a name an email and a password so let's provide the name and grab the request and read from there the name property and then we'll get the email, do the same, input email and the password. We'll sign password. Cool. Request input and password. Cool. So this works fine, but as you can see, there's no validation here. Like a password might be one character, and you're like, well, that's not really a password, right? So when you, well, when many Laravel developers begin and start to implement, what they do is they're like, all right, cool. So what I'll do is I'll make a password property and I'll do request, you know, and I'll do password. And then I'll do a whole bunch of these statements here, right? That's the beginning and that's how it makes sense. I mean, if you work, come from PHP without using a framework, sure, that's quite logical. Other people where, who are more smart cookies might then go, okay, request, validate, cool, and start using Laravel's validator, all right? So you can put here that, oops, without a caps lock, sorry, that password should be a minimum of eight characters. Come on, let's do it. Come on, computer, let's do it. <laughs> sorry about the, the internet connection. Uh, it's, it's coming from my phone. I don't have it linked up to the work one, that's why. <laughs> I'll put my phone here. All righty. So <laughs> hopefully that's better. Um, and that works fine, no problem for maybe a simple application, right? But as your validation starts getting more complicated, you might have to do a lot more custom logic than just that. 
you might have to reference another database table or something. You might have to query an API, maybe. Who knows? You don't know. So you can see how quickly this method, this store method, will become really bloated with a whole bunch of validation methods. This is where request objects come into play. So if we use Laravel's uh, command to make a request, and we'll make a store user request, all right? It will create a new file called store user request, of course. And I'll zoom in here. Okay, cool. This class's intention is to be able to validate the request that comes in and to maybe transform any information you need for your controller to understand it and pump it into the database or send it to an API or do whatever you need it to do. That's the purpose of the request uh, class. And so you've actually um, satisfied the separation of concerns principle. But the controller just cares about sending the data to the right location. It shouldn't care about any logic required to validate that data. The crest object takes care of that. So we'll start here by understanding this method. This is the authorized method. So it allows you to say, OK, who is allowed to utilize this to make this request? Is, should it be an admin? Should it be a user with a particular role? That's the idea. In this case, we don't really care about that, so we'll actually delete it. And so by default, it will say true. It will say no worries, anyone's allowed to make this request. So in here, you can actually specify what are the fields that you need to validate. So that password field that I just did before here, min8, I can just grab that and put that inside my store request right here. I can also say that I need a name. And pardon me, but I like to use the array syntax. Um, it should be a string. It is required, so it must be provide, provided. Provided require, required. Sorry about that. <laughs> it should be required. Um, likewise for the password. So if I actually now convert this to an array, and I can say, "Cool, this is required." And likewise the email. So I'll just copy this name and just for the sake of it here, uh, but the email should be of type email, right? So this request will actually process the request for me, validate it for me, and before it even reaches my controller, I know everything's okay. I know it's been validated, yes. In, in lining, because your, your concern is now in here. So because you see this is a function, right? I can actually put a whole bunch of code that might be specific to what is considered valid. Given that this is a simple example, I'm just using strings and saying it's required. But it could be, for example, that this email, right, needs to be of a certain domain. For example. It's just... Oh, yeah, that works good. No, it's just from security perspective. If I need to dive additionally, I could miss some intentional bug. If from security perspective, you what, sorry? When I have a regular validate, yep. I can immediately see what's going on. Yep. When there is additional diving in, yep. I can miss it because I'm lazy. OK, it could be the case, right? However, if you go to the controller and the method, let's say I delete this, right? This controller needs to be modified now to tell you how to validate this. So rather than accepting Laravel's default request object, I will accept the store user request object. So this reading this method immediately tells me who is validating my request. So you won't miss it because you'll see it in the function signature. Now, it could be that, OK, you're not familiar with the design pattern. That's fine. You might miss it if you're not familiar. But then again, a senior Laravel developer may come and tell you, hold on, the validation is humming, coming from this user request. That's the idea. You're right. You could still miss it, right? But you'll find it eventually. <laughs> That's true, though. That's true. OK. So, oh, yes. Come on, Max. One job. <laughs> One job. Yep. Just in relation to the um, controller where you're taking those validated inputs and putting them into the create yep. method, um, there's now the validate method yes. of the request that we can that use as well. That was my next step, yes. Yay. Very good. I like it. Anticipated <laughs> I like next it. Step. So exactly. So now that, as the lovely lady said, now that we have a request object, Laravel has validated for me. So this array, I do not need it anymore. 
Now I can grab the request and I can say, give me everything, oops, validated, give me everything that is valid. That is the idea of that. And this protects your models because your requests validate everything. You don't have to have anything specified inside your controller. You're still not convinced, I know. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, remember, it's a suggestion, right? <laughs> it's sexy, I like it, but still, fair enough. <laughs> no problem. All right, cool. So now, because we have created a user, all we have to do is wrap this in a user resource. And instead of using a collection, we will use make, because collection is for multiple, whereas make is for a single one. And so here, I can grab this and put this in here, and we're done. This is how you create a resource using a resource controller. Now, for those who may have had a keen eye and seen that there's a pattern here, every single resource you create because you've separated the concerns follows this exact same pattern. It will have a resource. It will call make on that resource. It will use that resource to call create, and it will validate the request. It will ask for the request for the validated data. And everything is copy-paste. So when you make another controller with a completely different resource, like a team, for example, this will be team resource. This will be user. And this will be team request, store team request. Benefits of this, Laravel uses stubs to be able to create these resource controllers. You can publish your stubs, in other words, permit them to your repository, and tweak them as you see fit so that they always follow this pattern. And so if you say create a model for team, for example, it will create the controller. It will call the request store team user request. It will call the resource team resource, and it will call the model team. And done. Yeah, sure, no problem. No worries. Uh, artisan stub publish. <laughs> They're good. Yeah, leaving the microphone. That's very lazy, Max. Come on, mate. Okay, cool. So I'll just close all this um, so you guys can see the stubs. So when I ran this command, sorry, the command is stub. If you guys can see on the bottom there, stub publish. So what that did is it created a folder here called stubs. And these are all of Laravel's stubs, as you can see. So if we have a look at, for example, the uh, resource controller stub, when I find it, I believe it's in model API. Here we go. Cool. So this is the stub that Laravel has. As you can see, it's all white because it's not valid PHP, but it's a template for PHP. And you can come down here to say, for example, the store. Oh, sorry, I will zoom in. My apologies. Here we go. You can come down here to say the store method, right, where you can see that the store request is placed in there as a template. And you can modify that to combine it with the model right here, right? So you can actually inject that template inside and make your own naming conventions so that everything is built out of the box. That's the idea. Cool. No, ah, thanks for suggesting. That was the next one I was going to suggest. <laughs> you, 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 I feel you're like you've seen my slides, I feel. <laughs> no, no worries. Come across the same. <laughs> right, excellent. Okay, cool. No worries. Um, so we'll go back to the um, presentation. Stop presenting and share the building APIs. Cool. You can do it. <laughs> okay, no worries, cool. Um, so inside uh, those resources, we can do a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the most powerful ones that we can do is actually returning nested relationships. So let's say your user is, belongs to a team. And when you request the user model, you would like to include the team as part of the response. So JSON resources uh, allow you to do this using a function called when loaded. It will actually check Eloquent to see if that relationship is loaded in the model. And if it is, it will execute this closure. Now, this closure, at the moment, I've used another resource to actually return and serialize. So if you can see here, uh, in this case, sorry, this example was for a team uh, resource. So in the team resource, uh, we had a relationship called the users. And so we actually use the user resource collection to serialize the user's key inside the team resource. We will do the reverse. We will make a team uh, resource, and we will include the team as part of the user. 
So I'll just uh, stop that and share again the code. Okay, cool. No worries. So hopefully it comes back online. Cool, you guys can see it? Cool, no worries. So I guess it's a great opportunity to actually use the dash dash all feature of the make model. So as you can see, I've actually run the command php and make model dash dash all and given it the name team. So Laravel should create a whole bunch of stuff for me. If you have a look, it's gone and created a team model. Hope you guys can see that. It's created a team factory for my database. It's created a migration for me, a seeder for me. I'm not gonna probably use any of these seeders, but whatever. It's created the store team request, and it's created the update team request. So we just spoke about request classes. Laravel itself includes it when you do dash dash all. And a controller and a policy. So let's actually go to the create team uh, migration. And just for the sake of testing, we will add a, uh, a string that's the name of the team, like that. And we'll go to the team factory. And in the team factory, when I zoom in here, sorry. In the team factory, I will make it generate a name for testing purposes. Uh, dollar sign this, Baker name. Cool, no worries. Um, all right, and now if we go to the user factory, uh, not the user factory, the user controller test, my mistake, we're actually gonna test the same thing here, but we're going to include, when we create the user, we'll actually create the team as well. So we, the factories in Laravel have a full method. It allows you to provide nested factories so that when Laravel creates the user, it will create the team and associate it to the user. So we'll send it the team factory. Oops, factory. There we go. Cool. And that should be all we need to actually make that test show the team. What we actually have to do, though, is go to the user model and link that relationship. So if we go to the user model, we can go down to the bottom here and we can do public function team and return a belongs to and return this belongs to and give it the team class. So that will actually make a foreign key link between the user and the team. And finally, we'll probably, uh, the two things to modify are the team resource, which it did not make, sorry. So unfortunately, the dash dash all does not create a team resource. Not sure why, but uh, maybe a PR that we could do to make Laravel do that. Uh, make resource, team resource. So that creates a, a resource for me. And now I can go to the team resource and again, I'll make an array here to be specific about what I want to return to my consumer. And I will return the name of the team. So if I go now to the user resource, I can say, okay, now if I have the team loaded, please return, include it in the response. So I will put a key called team, which will be the key where the team's gonna be. And I will say dollar sign this when loaded, and that will make it check uh, the eloquent model for the relationship called team, execute this closure. So I'll make a closure and I will return the team resource, make and dollar sign this team. There we go. So I'll just put this a bit tidier. All right, done. So that will make the resource, when it goes to serialize it, check if the eloquent model has the team relationship loaded and it will actually generate the team resource and include it as part of the response. So if we go now to the user controller, when we list the user right here in the user paginate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell eloquent to also load the team with it, like that, with team. And that will make eloquent load the related team along with the user. Let's run the test and see how we go. And where's my test? There we go. And I made a mistake somewhere. Let's have a look here. <laughs> mm, oh, yes, I did. That's, thank you. <laughs> no, you're right. Yes, I did forget to add that. My apologies. Yeah. So, uh, PH Madison, make migration, add, um, Team ID to users table. 
So if you use uh, Laravel's um, naming convention for the migration, which is add team ID to users table, when you actually open the migration, Laravel has actually realized you want to modify the users table and will include that as part of the boilerplate. So a nice little tip if it ever helps. Um, so I'll make it a big integer. I'll make it nullable just just cause, um, and I'll call it team ID. And also for the sake of it, I will do um, foreign key team ID references ID on team. I know most people probably like the new syntax. I like this syntax, so sorry. <laughs> but lots of people like the foreign key constraint syntax. I think this is clearer to me, but it's just my opinion. All right. Shall we run the test? And here we go. So if we now run the test, we will see that as part of the key, we can see the team name. So that's all that's required for nested relationships. And it actually expands much more powerful than that. There is a lovely package called the Sparty Laravel Query Builder, which allows you to basically comply with the JSON API spec. For those who are not familiar, the JSON API spec is a nice little specification to allow you to communicate and query with fields that you want returned, relationships you want loaded, filters, searches, all sorts of things like that, things that you probably know from the GraphQL world. Um, and so if you use a Laravel Query Builder, it will uh, load all relationships depending on what the consumer has requested in the include statement. So it's fantastic to use. Um, just raise my notes here somewhere. Okay, cool, no worries. Um, oh yeah, that was the last slide because I had to cut it short, that's right. <laughs> so I uh, will just share back my last slide, but it's basically questions and answers. <laughs> so I'll just share this slide. And sorry, Max, if I went over, I wasn't timing, but <laughs> I think I went over. Cool. Well, it's going to say it in a second. <laughs> any questions? Um, thanks for listening, guys. Any questions? I either confused everybody or, oh no, there we go. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I might have missed the... Thank you. I apologize if you already mentioned this at the end, but um, what's your go-to solution for generating um, Swagger doc? Uh, so <laughs> uh, in my experience, I've done it manually, unfortunately, um, but I got really excited, uh, I think it was two months ago, when a package was released that actually tra uh, travels through your Laravel code base, checks all your request classes, checks all your controllers, and checks all your resources, and generates the Squat Swagger doc for you based on your code. So the great benefit of using that is that you can generate that Swagger on the fly now, which is fantastic in my opinion. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for that question. <laughs> it was called something Stitch Switch. I will share it. I got it on my phone, but I'll share it, yeah. Cool. Hey, Ruben. Yes, yeah, hey. awesome talk, man. Um, thank you. Have you ever? <laughs> oh yeah, Python developer converted to PHP. Cool, thank you. Have, have you um, ever worked on an app uh, written in a domain-driven design, and have you used Laravel um, to do that? Yes, I have. So the uh, next part of my um, presentation is actually about that and extending uh, this functionality to also incorporate command the command pattern. Um, and when you utilize the command pattern, you actually make objects that encapsulate your application logic. As you can imagine, and as an application gets extremely big, you will get a lot and a lot of commands. So domain-driven design allows you to categorize all those commands and separate the business logic, not separate it, but shall we say, place it together, uh, the, the different verticals of your application, and organize your code base much nicer. It also makes it so that you generally, when you break something, you're only breaking that domain and you don't break other domains. That was obviously the case scenarios where you can, but um, it's, it's a fantastic approach and I highly recommend it if anybody's working on very large code bases, use the domain driven design command pattern, it will save you a lot of pain. Can I ask, uh, is that a delicate refactor? Like, did you go from some massive it's, it, Laravel it, it, it app it to... Actually, it's actually easier than you might think. You start with a basic command for each controller. So in your controller, you will have a method that holds a bunch of business logic, right? So you just grab that, copy paste it into a class and you start from there. It's actually easier than many people think because um, you know I understand the concern and the worry of breaking something, but if you can isolate all your application logic from your controller, put it inside a class, you can then refactor slowly as you go without breaking anything. So it's actually quite easier than one might think. 
Yes, that's right. Lots of people use different names. Yeah, I use actions as well, actually. I just, yeah, the name of the pattern is the command pattern, but I, use, I like to use actions to avoid confusion with uh, artisan commands. Yeah. Yes, Mitch. Sorry, I'm just waiting. Anyone has any oh, any other questions? Sorry. Maybe during the break, I just move Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for the question, guys, and thanks a lot for listening to me. Appreciate it. All righty. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, f feel free to get up, get some pizza. Um, I'm just going to put something on the screen during the break. While I still have some attention. Uh, oh, wait, I'm not presenting, am I? Okay, so guys, um, yeah, feel free to grab some pizza. We got some beers out, but you're not limited to those beers. You can get any beers. We're just like trying to move move the drinking along. Uh, during the break, have a just scan this QR code here. Basically, what we're doing is we're doing like a really really quick survey. There's just one question, which is what kind of topics would you like to see in future meetups? Very typical, very easy. Just think of anything. Now. Uh, out of the people that suggest something, we're just going to pick at random. I promise. I promise we're going to pick at random one person who will win the Laracon AU ticket prize. And look, even if you've already bought a ticket, you know, maybe you can give it to a colleague, maybe you can give it to your friend, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your mom, your grandma. You know, Laracon is broad appeal kind of uh, conference, especially this one. There's a lot of different topics. Um, so yeah, just I'll, I'll leave this QR code here all break. So just come up here, scan the QR code, just uh, put in any suggestion, any suggestion at all, and um, you go in the lucky prize draw to win. Yeah, no worries. Um, can the meetup people hear me? Yeah, the Google Meet? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool, um, cool. So I just wanted to um, an answer a question that I was uh, sh shared on the Google Meet while I was speaking, and I didn't realize it was asked. So it was a question from a, a person called Sam, who said, could you give an example of querying several tables or how you execute more complicated queries apart from the basic CRUD? Um, so I just wanted to clarify, clarify this. Uh, in essence, whenever you are manipulating or retrieving data, you are actually always doing CRUD. The only difference is depends on how many tables you need in that query to be able to get the information and eventually maybe store it in a request. So when I was returning the user uh, model and I loaded the team, that was a basic example of using multiple tables. Obviously, a very simple query, but you can, inside your controller, make a much more complicated query and return that to the resource. And the resource can have the complicated structure that you need for your consumer to see that complicated query. Um, so the same concepts apply. The only difference is how complicated you decide to make your query. So the same concepts apply. That's all. Hopefully, that answers the question, Sam, um, if you are still there. If it didn't answer your question, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn, Sam, and I'll be... Oh, he is there. Fantastic, Sam. Excellent. So if you have a specific scenario um, that you would like to ask about, then by all means, contact me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to answer you. Cool. Thank you. Great. Um, I was going to say grab some pizza and sit down, but I think everybody's already sitting. So yeah, yeah. there, there is still uh, pizza left. There's plenty of beers. So... And if you want to hang around after the meetup and have some conversations, that's totally fine with us. Uh, we'll be here. Uh, but yeah, let's let's introduce our next speaker here, Aiden. I think it's the first time you've spoken at least at this meetup, right? So yeah, um, you know, welcome. Thank you very much for volunteering. Uh, on that um, 
on the QR codes uh, survey thing. I think we had like 15 responses, so I would just go away and pick a winner now, and I'll, I'll announce it after this talk, so I'll announce it straight away. Um, and yeah, without any further delay, let's 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 listen to Aiden's talk about uh, gRPC. Um, hi everyone. Yeah, it's uh, on. Okay, my name is Aiden. I'm a software engineering contractor. Currently, my client is Gumtree Group. So, if you don't mind, you can scan the QR code and answer this question before I start my presentation. How is it? Is it a second? Let me see if I can fix it. Um, now you can select multiple options. Can you try? <coughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> you can continue like replying if you haven't. And okay, actually, uh, just uh, looking at the answers, I see five people mentioned they have used GPA, GPRPC. Could you raise your hand? Okay, wonderful. At least one person in the office. Uh, I see most of you have, or I don't know, most or whatever, 18 people use REST, 14 SOAP, and XML RPC, five people. JSON uh, RPC, four people, which is still interesting because I didn't expect much answer for that option. Okay, <clears throat> so. Uh, have you ever wondered if the protocol that you are using for your services or your API is the best option that you have or the best uh, performance that you can get? Um, in this talk, I will uh, have a quick overview of uh, gRPC and uh, I will show you some sample codes keeping it uh, short and sweet and trying to make it practical so you can see whatever that you can achieve directly by just looking at the sample code. So this is the definition of RPC. Yeah. Uh, many of the protocols that you saw on the uh, that uh, page were uh, actually RPCs. Uh, one of them may be less, like REST, and GraphQL uh, because of the reasons that we will see. But RPC in general, you call another function, another procedure, remote procedure call on another system, usually on another machine on the network. Uh, this, uh, the aspect that differs uh, RPC to like REST is that in RPC you have uh, the exact data structure that uh, the host or the server expect uh, regarding the parameters type and uh, schema. Uh, if I could, 
this is how it works. It can be generalized to like uh, gRPC, SOAP, and XML RPC, JSON RPC, etc. Um, okay, so you have your uh, uh, clients. Each client may have uh, one, uh, uh, not one, a bunch of stops. Those stops are usually generated by the RPC protocol that you are using. So if you look at the diagram, uh, color, uh, firstly this example, you want to send like a text message. You, you don't have the infrastructure to send the text message yourself. You have to call a, a third party API to do so. Um, like a user has finalized a purchase, you want to send a text message. So you want to send like, uh, send message, blah, blah, blah. If you want to do that using like a REST API, you have to craft a, a HTTP request and do the stuff using another layer. But using RPC, you can directly send your message. Like from color client, you send your like uh, send text message something. And desktop that is provided by your uh, RPC protocol will handle conversion of the uh, arguments from your programming language, maybe PHP, to the server's programming language, which may be Java. And it will just send that. You don't need to worry about uh, like any networking, any uh, data conversion, any mapping in, uh, in between. So it is quite uh, straightforward, I believe, using RPC in general. Uh, if you, uh, if we look at the like the timeline of AP, uh, RPC protocols, uh, you will see that like uh, uh, XML RPC uh, followed by so both developed by Microsoft, JSON RPC a couple of years ago, and uh, I see, okay, GPRC and GraphQL uh, are quite new. So uh, GRPC is, I guess, around eight years old now. Not as major as the older one, but because of the reasons that you will see in coming slides, it is quite appealing to uh, many use cases. Uh, any question? Okay. So, uh, Many of you, yeah, I see 14 people mentioned that they used, they have used SOAP in their projects. It is a beautiful protocol, I, I think. So uh, gRPC and SOAP have many similarities. The only maybe significant drawback of uh, SOAP Sorry, is that... We have a, we have a <laughs> Sorry? I was under the impression that JSON is all-inclusive. Pardon? Whatever you want to send, you can send through JSON. Mm, I didn't get the question. JSON already serves everything. Ah, oh, okay, I, I, okay. So JSON is the payload format. It is not, uh, okay, I, I will get back to that one in the coming slides, but we have uh, different protocols. Each protocol will communicate with uh, like the server uh, in different formats. Like, uh, like in this diagram, you see SOAP, uh, uh, XML RPC, they use XML. Uh, REST, uh, JSON RPC, uh, they use JSON mostly. Uh, gRPC uses binary format, uh, but uh, yeah, which I talk about that in a few minutes, and uh, and GraphQL has its own like data structure. So that is another uh, aspect of uh, RPCs: the format that you send your uh, payload. Pardon? Uh, okay, yeah, we are using to that one in the coming so it's mostly about grpc we will see 
Okay. So just to compare before we reach to that point, uh, you know that PHP supports uh, SOAP for, uh, protocol embedded. So you have the uh, uh, classes and uh, uh, tools that you need to have a like a SOAP uh, request and response. You see how uh, uh, neat and uh, concise is creating a server and using that. So like we have two methods on the server side, like, uh, let me just change my, okay. So you see that we have like a get message, add numbers, you define those uh, methods on your uh, PHP site. You use this class to create a server using uh, this is stops or one stop and uh, you set the class and your server is ready to receive uh, requests so anyone in the world can just send uh, uh, request to this server by uh, ideally using a file named wsdl so if you have that file and the url to the server you can call all these methods like the way that you call them locally. Uh, so this was an example. Now let's talk about gRPC. Uh, it has been uh, uh, used heavily by Google, I guess around maybe 20 years or something, but it is uh, uh, really publicly uh, as I mentioned before, uh, around eight years ago. It is uh, one of the most efficient ways or efficient protocols to communicate uh, between services that you have in your microservice architecture. It is uh, based on HTTP2 protocol and has like a bidirectional uh, connection you will use a simple service definition language. You will see an example of that shortly. You can quickly start using that and uh, uh, officially it uh, supports around, I guess, 20 languages and many other programming languages by third parties. Uh, currently, it doesn't support gRPC server in PHP, but there are tools that you can use to create your PHP server uh, or PHP gRPC server. Okay, uh, back to the question about payload and what is JSON, uh, like uh, their JSON relation to this talk. So protocol uh, buffers is the uh, corresponding uh, uh, protocol to JSON, and you use that to uh, define your data structure. You use that to specify the data types, like from, I don't know, from C Sharp to Java, from J Node.js to PHP, it maps everything. You include those in uh, your protocol buffers. It is beautifully uh, backward and forward compatible. Uh, it has that compa compatibility feature. Uh, we will see that shortly as well, maybe uh, in another slide. Uh, protocol buffer is a collection of tools. It is the definition language. You define the uh, structure, uh, your me messages structure and uh, services in a file, um, uh, in a portal file. Uh, it generates the uh, clients and like a stop for your programming language. Uh, it has the like a runtime environment and handles the serializing of your uh, package from like, I don't know, text, whatever to binary. It is suitable to handle uh, messages that are 
up to a few megabytes. Uh, Google says that if you have mes larger messages which you want to send across, maybe use other uh, protocols. But on their website, they claim that it is heavily used by Google for data storage and for network communication. Uh, like you can store your data in this uh, format, and you can also use that for like any kind of communication. Okay, here is how it works. Uh, so you create your data structure or your def you define the data structure in a file named proto, uh, in a file, uh, proto file. Uh, as an input, the compiler receives that one and outputs like uh, desktops some people say it generates quotes. It may be a bit misleading. It just generates this stuff, like the clients, like the basic for you. It doesn't magically just generate like useful function. It just creates the base. Uh, like it is a step maybe unnecessary for PHP compiled classes. And uh, once the compiler creates this stuff, you can use that in your application. Here's a good example. Like you have, uh, you want to send some data that uh, represents a person information like uh, name, ID, and email from uh, like a PHP client to a Java server. Uh, you specify your data structure using this uh, format. Uh, it is um, easy and quick to learn like uh, Porto, uh, data structure is quite uh, concise and easy to understand. Uh, you can specify like if this is, uh, uh, I, I, I don't go to, uh, into the details, you can look at it online, but let, let's keep it just as simple as this one. Uh, so you have this person class, this one is generated, this one is generated based on this proto file for your PHP client. So you, uh, I'm sorry, this client, yeah, <laughs> PHP, this site. So uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> from Java to PHP, you have like a person uh, that is generated in a Java um, environment and you want to retrieve that and use it in PHP. Like here, it is the Java version. You set ID, set name, set email, build. And you can uh, like uh, save the information or uh, store the, uh, the person data in a file. Now you can uh, retrieve that one using the PHP stuff. Like new person, this class again is generated this based on the proto file. Like, uh, Merge data from a string, John, get ID, get name, and get email. So this is just the proto uh, structure. We haven't reached to the server client side communication. But once you have this language, once you have the definition of your payload, you are not far from uh, creating a server, actually. Now here, <clears throat> using the same protocol, yeah, you saw that in this slide, we defined the uh, data structure. Uh, and here, with a similar syntax, we, uh, we define our services, like greet, uh, greet here, say hello, return below, and say hello again. Yeah, you can have a look to the code. And this is like the format of uh, input. You see, hello request. It says, hello request needs a name, which is a string. Uh, hello reply also needs a similar structure. Uh, and you define that greet term, like hello return, hello reply, those are stuff. So you define now a service. And now you can see how once you generate, once you compile the proto file, 
it will generate a class for you. Uh, this class has like set name, like you see that? Hello request. <laughs> Okay, you see, say hello. It is in PHP. It is uh, yeah, asynchronized and like it has a wait message or something. You can uh, like use any of those stuff. Uh, and this one wasn't mentioned in the previous slide. But no, it, yeah, it is how uh, uh, you run the service. Uh, this is in like a uh, Node.js uh, 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 implementation. So this is the server is Node.js, your client is PHP. The services were defined by this file. And now, uh, now this is like the JavaScript and uh, PHP implementation. Any questions about this specific one? Okay, uh, so what options we have regarding the PHP and uh, like server implementation? There are two solutions currently. Uh, th uh, this one, you can create pure PHP servers using gRPC. Maybe it is not as mature as uh, native or official implementations. Yep. Sorry, does include the mechanism how to decipher the message which you received? How we design them? No, no. So imagine you are alien civilization, okay? Far, far away from Earth, okay? And want to send them a message. Yes. But the message is complicated. So we're not just sending the message, it's a plain text, JSON or whatever. We as well sending along the instructions how to decipher it. Uh, so okay. one sec. So from what I heard, I understood that this is exactly the case, that you have application A and you have application B. Application B doesn't know what sort of data structure to receive from A, but knows essential alphabet, knows how to read. And when it receives message from the application A, it's saying, okay, ah, here's some data and here's some instructions how to read it. Which means the message in incorporates as well the functions. Am I correct or am I wrong? Um. Maybe this one helps. So you want to know how they understand each other, how they perform the services that are requested. Is it the question? You want to, you wonder how What's they the understand. What's the payload like... in the message? Sorry? What's the payload in the message? What you're transmitting from point uh, A to that, point B? I understand it's not your product. You are just presenting and I no, appreciate. It's... Yeah. Just want to understand how it works. So this one, uh, once it is uh, like, this is the Java version, okay? So you assign everything to it. It has like this uh, class available for you. It is provided by GPRC, GRPC. You send that and it generates a binary file for you or a binary stream. You can send it over ne uh, to, uh, to a client on, on the network or you can save it like a JSON file. You can uh, consider everything like a JSON. They are like a way to transfer data. And if you look at this here, like a client can read the file like new person serialize data like a JSON file, like a JSON file, you run, you, uh, you run JSON decode. Is it, you know that 
when you use JSON decode. Yes. I know it all, but okay. Still. So this is like JSON decode for you, and it decodes that to this information. So when you take in the JSON, okay. Okay. Assuming that party A knows about JSON, party B knows about JSON. Yes. All the structure is conveyed. Uh, okay. Now, party A knows something, party B does not, and you want from party A to convey all information to party B. Is the case? Does it have additional payload about the structure no. of the data? Uh, no. So, once you define your uh, services like this, it's you implement that definition. So these are like uh, two methods. They are your services. You define, you implement them. Like in Java, JavaScript like this, in PHP like this. So this is server, this is the client, right? So those functions, you send them later on to your server like your server you say that like this is the implementation of that service that you are asking for this is the other one now it knows that which how to run them so each client and server has its own translation in the background or adapter or transformer yeah. that takes it from let's say the java original it translates it to the binary using that proto definition, kind of like a data transfer object potentially. Yes. And right. then you send that binary serialized version of that to the PHP one. The PHP one interprets that and translates it back into PHP variables. Yeah? Yes, exactly. So. <laughs> Fine. I think we're missing the packaging yeah i think that's the confusion here so you as you defined on slide three or four that you make a proto a proto file right and that acts like a definition file is that correct uh like this yeah so it acts like same thing as what would be like a swagger api it's a yeah, definition yeah, exactly yeah. they are like um uh, uh, json schema as well if you have used them uh and in a uh, GraphQL, you define similar yep. structure. Yeah. So that proto file is then each each side of the of the communication has that proto file. The Java one has that proto file. The PHP has it, so they can generate their code to coincide with this proto file. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, this is just one uh, proto for every language. So the server and client all use the same thing. Yep. And that's that makes sense. So generate, yeah. And I'm guessing that PHP has again. I don't have experience in this area, right? But it does have a program that can interpret this proto file uh, and generate the PHP code to be able to. Yeah. So for PHP, uh, for PHP. You have uh, an extension yep. which you can install, and it understands uh, the it can uh, serialize and deserialize yep. uh, proto buff uh, format. Right. Yeah. There I may be that, yeah. pure PHP implementation. I haven't checked, but yep, that's fine. Is it like a JSON? You know, JSON is the embedded like or YAML files. You can. Uh, yep. Code yeah, and decode yeah, yeah, yeah. them in PHP. This is similar. Yep. I get it. Yeah, that's fine. That makes sense. And so Java obviously has its version as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah, like yeah, JSON, like uh, many other. But this one is binary and it has data definition and service definition yep. embedded. Um, it Does that answer your question? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yep. Awesome. See? Yeah. So root runner is like. Not, a, no more questions until the end. <laughs> No, it's fine. You can. They can ask. Okay, R R Roadrunner uh, uh, uses uh, like a Go uh, middleware to run your PHP code. Uh, so you can use that to uh, create a PHP backend to serve your gRPC. 
or openness is wool fully by pronouncing it's fully uh, openness fully yeah it also has uh, uh, the technical uh, requirements for grpc implementation so it is okay you can use that one as well and this is like a comparison between uh, rest client or uh, rest uh, request response to uh, get some uh, data like here <clears throat> uh it is uh some assets you run this uh you call this endpoint and it re uh, returns those uh, stuff for you you most of you are familiar with this one for graphql you have the data structure defined you get you send those stuff and uh, get response in that format as well but using it uh, an RPC protocol, it is way simpler and more efficient in my view to get the same data or at least a similar uh, uh, data structure by purely calling the endpoints. I, I guess many of you have uh, uh, thought about that, that REST is simple in concept, but it uh, but it doesn't provide you uh, features or many features that you may need during your development. You always need to use your like uh, innovation and uh, creativity to implement the stuff. There is no uh, like uh, uh, ubiquitous way to implement that. So it is painful uh, in a more complex uh, settings. Uh, particularly endpoint themselves, just you have to figure out how to implement them. Another uh, aspect is uh, REST is uh, good for like uh, create, read, write, those stuff. But when you have many actions which are not necessarily about CRUD, um, you have to again uh, create your own way to implement them. But with any RPC implementation, you can just call that. Easy. Don't need you don't need to think about like HTTP method, which code I need to respond. All of them are handled for you by the client, by the uh, RPC compiler uh, or implementation like the RPC uh, server. Uh, here a quick uh, comparison with them. Uh, of them, uh, okay, RPC, SOAP, REST, and GraphQL. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, very distinctive feature of uh, SOAP and RPC is uh, SOAP uses XML format, which are uh, notoriously heavy. Uh, while GraphQL uses the smallest possible package size when it is compiled and uh, serialized. Uh, on the other hand, many uh, financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, they are still using SOAP. It is a standard, uh, it is like a W3C standard. It has many features, it is stable and uh, reliable. Uh, so I guess uh, SOAP is still a good option when you need to uh, represent your endpoint to uh, third parties. But for all internal communication inside your microservice architecture, uh, possibly uh, uh, gRPC is a better option. Um, yeah, you can have a quick look to other stuff that are mentioned in this slide. Uh, we can uh, talk about each of them like separately because uh, like for uh, mobile uh, apps, apparently GraphQL is quite popular. I uh, haven't created a server, a GraphQL server personally, 
but we, in my uh, uh, team, another person had to do so, and it was a, a painful job to create a GraphQL ser uh, server. Uh, for this, uh, as you can see, it is easy to learn, but you have to do a lot of hard work. Like uh, it is uh, very interesting. For REST, you don't need any extra tools. You just need a programming language and a way to send HTTP requests. Yeah, uh, and that's enough. But it doesn't provide you with any other uh, features like uh, exception handling, load balancer, or many other stuff. Uh, so it is easy to learn, but more work to do. Another uh, table, if you can. Yeah, uh, as you see, SOAP is uh, useful for stateful uh, uh, protocol uh, implementation, but none of other protocols support that. OK, thank you. And uh, I would like to ask you, have you ever had any challenges with any of these protocols and make it like a, a discussion and dialogue about that and give me some like viewpoints, maybe after if I answer any possible questions. No question? Yep, does anybody have, yep, but right here. Um, you mostly talked about, uh, you know, how to implement uh, gRPC, but what about, uh, you know, the performance side? Uh, how much is it better than uh, REST API, actually? It is uh, uh, hugely uh, more performance in, uh, like, uh, uh, high uh, traffic uh, applications, like, uh, uh, gRPC uses HTTP2. It can uh, send a stream. Your client can also act like a server for bidirectional communication. It has plugins for load balancing, authentication, and uh, like health check and other stuff. Um, so you can uh, uh, benefit from all features built in. One very like appealing aspect of that is Google is using if you is using that heavily. So Google is like a giant uh, company with really uh, like galactic uh, kind of data flow. So I guess that is a good proof that it is mature enough. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And one of the fronts. So again, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I understand it is that, let's say you have some far, far away station on the Mars, which has just the hardware defined some operational system. And it's supposed to receive information now and forever. And because you have this proto mechanism, which essentially every time in the beginning of a session provides the Rosetta Stone how to interpret everything, you can keep the things in the stone, literally, and the rest is interpreted based on the proto file. So the station on Mars can receive signals which are valid today. It will understand what will happen in 10 years and in 1,000 years. So this protofile makes it essentially future proof. I, I can get that. Uh, but are you referring to my comment about forward compatibility and backward compatibility? No, no. Are literally you about, about the how mechanism how the, service? the data is, the structure of the data is delivered during the session in the protofile. Uh, okay. So, so uh, okay. So maybe uh, um, another aspect, maybe I should talk about that. Like it is how the service is discovered because different protocols have uh, different degrees of 
discoverability. Like with gRPC, the only things that you need to communicate to Earth and Mars is just have that compiled gRPC uh, uh, classes and just use them. Uh, but like in REST, uh, uh, or maybe compare that with like uh, XML RPC, you don't have uh, those definitions uh, readily available to be used. For REST, uh, you have some sort of uh, uh, documentation by just only specifying a single way of communication, like HTTP, verbs, and uh, response codes. So you don't, even if you don't read any documentation, you can connect to the REST endpoint usually. With gRPC, it is a step further because you get the stop. You even have the validation and methods and classes to interact with the server. You know what I mean? So your IDE, your PHP storm, whatever IDE that you use, it has the autocompilate, like uh, uh, you connect to server like you are uh, uh, calling uh, local methods. It is the Rosetta Storm in our lingo. Sorry? It's like an SDK. It's virtual protein. Yes, uh, actually, I can show you. Instead of software or application defined, it's again comes through a protofile. Yes. That one defines the structure and also the services like. Okay. The proto, sorry, the proto only sits uh, in the, the server, yeah? It doesn't sit in the client as well, yeah? Or does it? Um, it so under, yeah, in runtime, you don't really need that uh, because, uh, yeah, they are compiled and on, on like both uh, sites. Uh, yeah, if you want to change them, uh, you change them and you compile a new set again. So those are, as far as I understand, temporarily, like, you don't have to. Uh, so that's the data that you send is already validated by the proto. Yeah, the yeah. So, so you, it, will not be, it will not be sent to the to the to the server if it's uh, actually incorrect. Uh -huh. or, you know, the general uh, structure is validated. Like, uh, if you look at uh, this example, you see yeah. it has like int 32, a string, those stuff. So th they can be validated at you know, like client and uh, because the f you have to put it in this format. I understand that. But does you have to? At the beginning of a session, the protofile is distributed. In the beginning of a session, the protofile is uh, distributed? No, not and really. Uh, you know, one uh, that uh, protofile just uh, trains the client and server how to send serialized uh, messages. Once, because they both uh, encode in the same format, they can decode that as well because so they have the like the expected format already. They don't necessarily need that one, but of course you keep these funds for future because okay. Yeah. On Earth, you updated your protofile, okay? Yeah. And now with updated protofile, you are sending the message to the Mars, but yeah. Mars doesn't have yet updated protofile. Uh, okay. Some information will be lost, so yeah, it, it needs to be communicated first. And I would expect it will happen in the beginning of a session. If you change the like uh, proto, you need to most of them uh, uh, oh, is it it out of session communication. You know, all formats um, are compatible. Uh, uh, okay, new uh, uh, versions of the same message are compatible with old ones, in the sense that in uh, Proto file, you cannot uh, like now, nah, like consider a string name. Okay, in the future you do like you want to store full name instead of name, but you, your new implementation may confuse the name. Is it uh, like first name or is it full name? 
uh, in your new implementation, you put like a string A with another number, a, a sequential number. And all of them have a default value. So if in the future you delete a field, its default value is still presented. So the old uh, compiles or uh, programs should be able to read that. And if uh, like you add new ones, because the previous one were unaware of the new ones, they still should be able to handle the new messages because they just don't know about the new one and they ignore that and they use the old one. And they are all stored and they will remain like, uh, this is just a manual step. Uh, I don't know why it is like that exactly, but in uh, Porto buffer, uh, specification they warn you to not use the same number again because it will be catastrophic okay so okay so back compatibility is a plus number. i like it Pardon? but again back compatibility i like it okay so that the all station which doesn't have the update information still able to read yes but the station without updated portafile will be still missing some information so when at which stage the proto file is communicated? Yeah. Is it during the beginning of the session? Uh, is it off the session? No, it is not communicated. Only the uh, uh, yeah binary files are communicated. Uh, if you use the new version, you need to compile your new version and distribute it to your server and client. So they understand okay, the new version. Okay, so you need to have a new binary. Yes, compile the new in order to new understand. Version. Yes. So it's API defined. Yes. So your endpoint is changed. You have to update that by the new compiled version. <laughs> Please ask questions. No questions. Okay, thank you. All righty, thank you very much, Aiden. Uh, yeah, I think I will definitely not do the third talk because it's getting late. Um, and surely you want to have some more pizza and beer, right? Uh, I will do the talk at the next meetup. <laughs> The teaser. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, teaser. What? Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, the, the talk is a fun talk. There's um, there's a lot of stuff in there about, in particular, Laravel queuing, scheduling, um, and also about parallel execution, both in CLI and HTTP. So um, I did this talk in Brisbane last month, I think. And it, it's a pretty long talk, so it took, like, over an hour, I think, with Q&A. Um, but I will probably do it at the very next meetup, um, as in the next meetup in Sydney. But I just, you know, if I do it now, it's going to be pretty late by the time I finish. But don't worry, it will be done. Um, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, however, uh, yeah, before we conclude, so once again, thank you to my company, Cover Genius, for sponsoring the meetup. Um, yeah. And once again, feel free to grab some beers that put, put every beer we have, I think, um, although maybe not the cider. So have some beers, help us finish the pizza because